Okay, welcome to tonight's live stream demo. It's been a while since I've done one of these. And it's good to be back in the saddle. Tonight what I'm going to do, I'm going to run you through some of the basic techniques that I use when working in watercolour, which many of you would have noticed I've been refocusing on to start the year. I'm still working in all my, all my mediums, but at this point in time, re-exploring the watercolour has been a nice, fun little experiment. So I'm just going to run you through what I'm using, how I get started, and this will be stuff that we will cover more of in my introduction to painting courses coming up later in the year. So I'm just working on a basic little watercolour block here. This is a 100% cotton block. When it comes to watercolour, paper is crucial. Choosing the right paper can be the difference between getting it to do what you want and having it be an absolute nightmare to work on. What you're going to find if you go a wood pulp paper, which is what you will normally find in all the basic watercolour pads, is the moment they get wet, the pulp is going to expand. Once it does, it never returns to its flat form, so it becomes very difficult long term to get there and do anything major on them. I find the watercolour blocks great, and especially in the, the cotton ones, because basically once I've finished my painting, I've got a nice, flat, unbuckled surface that can go straight into a frame or a mat and be shipped wherever I need them to go. To get me started on the paper, I just get there and do a very basic little masking tape border. Most of these pieces only take me an hour to a day to get there and complete, so at this size they're great for plain air work, and I just find that having that white border around it keeps it a bit cleaner. It also stops the paper, if you, what I've found, if you work right to the edge of the surface, you will find there will be a little bit of warping and buckling over the time, depending on how many layers that you do on it. With my palette, I'm keeping things very simple here, but I'll just run you through what I'm working with. I try and keep with basically two of each primary in my mixes. So we have lemon yellow to kick off, cadmium yellow, so a warmer yellow and a cool yellow, Brilliant Red, which is essentially a cadmium red substitute. Crimson. Dioxazine Violet. Ultramarine Blue. Lately I've been introducing Cobalt Blue into my mixes for watercolour. I also have Turquoise. Phthalo Blue. Viridian. A little bit of Burnt Sienna and a little bit of Burnt Umber. And with that, I can pretty much do anything I need. So, I'm just taking 2B pencil here, and I'm going to quickly sketch up the scene that we're going to work with today. This is just one of my old reference photos of Mount Martha, a place that I've painted many, many times over the years. Having exhibited down at the gallery at original laws back in the day. This was a favourite stomping ground of mine for quite some time. And I always love getting back to painting this area. So I'm choosing this particular reference because there's a lot of light in this. It's essentially a very sun-drenched scene. It also gives me a chance to play with some rock pool shallows which in a couple of weeks, on the 25th, I will be running a workshop on how to paint these sorts of scenes in more detail. I'm 
Now, I come from a pencil background, so I do tend to draw as much information as I need to get myself going. It's not crucial, and it doesn't have to be perfect, but just having those few little key markers in does make life a bit easier when applying the paint. Now, what I am going to do is I am just going to tape up my horizon line here. Just keeping it a little bit higher than the end of the headland. And we're going to pre-wet this area. So I have, I just use a varnish brush rather than a watercolor mop for wetting my paper. I find this holds the water really, really well and flows across the surface quite nicely. So I've always found this has been quite a useful brush. So really saturating the area. What is a crucial thing to remember with watercolor is pre-wetting the paper is going to make sure that the paint stays where you want it to be. Okay, so I'm just going to tilt this for a second. You'll see how much water is on that. That is very wet. And that's what I want. I want a really slick surface here. Not in terms of the paper texture, but in terms of the water coverage. The more water you have on the paper, the more the paint is going to sort of filter across that surface. Now we're dealing with late afternoon. So I just want to bring in a tiny bit of cad yellow. And this is going to be floated across very gently. into my sky. Super light glazing here. Or a wash, pretty much. I'm going to pick up just a touch of my crimson as well. Just want a tiny bit of crimson just along the horizon. just to float it in. I don't need to do too much here. I want to keep the sky very light, but I just wanted to get that initial wash in to influence. And you can see the moment I take away the tape, while it looked like it was pretty much a non-existent wash, there is actually a fair bit of color in there certainly enough to influence what we're going to be working with coming forward. Keep in mind when you're working in watercolor that it will always dry lighter than what you apply with your wet paint. So as long as you stick to that rule, you'll be fine. I always start with the sky. Doesn't matter what medium I'm using, the sky is my main element. It's my controller for my light source and will generally influence all the other colors that I'm going to be working with throughout my scene. Now, I can't work directly down from there at the moment because what will happen is the paint will just bleed into itself. So what we're going to do, i will just give my brush a quick wash out and I am now going to start pre-wetting the lower part of the water here. I don't need much color in here. And I'm being very careful with this water application not to hit the horizon. I don't want it to bleed. I want that area to be kept quite crisp. Now I'm just going to pick up the tiniest amount. To start off with, I'm going to keep to the big brush. Most of my stuff I do with one or two brushes. I find it's a really good exercise 
forces you to really control your brushwork. I'm just taking some cobalt in here. And you can see, because I've pre-wet the area, the paint's just going to start dispersing through this space. And you can use that to your advantage just by running little brush strokes that separate. Watercolor for me is all about getting those delicate passes first. Whether that's getting the soft fuzzy edges through your clouds and sky or a nice little graduated wash like what we've just done here. Going to now introduce a tiny bit of phthalo. Now, phthalo is potent. Remember this. You can see how intense that color is on the palette. All right. Very, very intense color. Use it wisely. So, all I am going to do is introduce just in the shadow areas of where these rocks are a touch of this. Because a little. A if I go too much, it will kill it very quickly. I just want to get there and influence what's already here. Anytime you're introducing a pigment into an existing wash that's still wet, Always make sure that you are applying more pigment than what was in the original wash. If you don't, you will find that it will become, you'll start getting crazing in the paint. Now to control this, I'm just taking another brush. This has got nothing on it. I can essentially just push and pull the puddles around as I want them to be. Up in this area, I really don't need a huge amount. I will run the tiniest touch in against the edge of the forms up here. At this point, I'm just going to introduce a tiny bit of my burnt sienna as well. Just in this little foreground puddle, I want to reflect some color back down here, showing the rock surface reflected back down in, under, the, under the water. Wetting my brush, just cleaning it out. I'm going to drag the clean brush through the top puddle and just get some soft lines in this background section to show some movement on the surface. For me, water is always about rhythm and line. So I like to get there and approach it with this method, just breaking the surface gently. So this gets a lot of my initial stuff ready to go. 
Very simple palette, nothing over overdone. Now for a lot of my stuff, I like to utilize the muck on my palette. Because it's really, really handy to get some of the more subtle stuff in play. We're just going to run some little touches. So that was just my burnt sienna mix that I used through here with the same yellow crimson that was used in the foreground, in the sky, sorry. With a little bit of the phthalo in there. This is going to help me set up the base shadow for our cliff. And I'll build this up with a couple of layers. I don't need to go straight to the, the end result straight away. I want to take my time on this and build it gradually. The gradual approach, especially when you're starting out, is a much safer way to work. We're just going to introduce a tiny bit of burnt umber here. I'll bring the crimson into play with that. This is going to give us a touch more warmth through some of these shadows. Mainly as we pull forward to work toward where the light is. We've got a lot of light streaming across this section. I'm going to just rough in some little patches here and there. See how the cool and the warmer into sort of getting a nice little interplay happening here. These are the things that you want to go searching for. I'm going to get a little bit more of our CAD yellow going. This is going to help set up some of the more brilliant greens on this cliff face. Taking a touch of the phthalo to this. While I have Viridian on the palette, I'll very rarely ever use it. I don't normally like using tube greens. They're a convenience factor, but I find you get a lot more richness by actually working with the base pigments instead. Into that, we're going to grab some lemon yellow. I'm not really going to thin this down too much. I want to apply this a bit thicker. And this is going to help start getting some glow against this part of the cliff. You'll notice I'm leaving little touches of the white of the paper. This is actually a really crucial thing. You don't want to kill your paper. You, the, the white of the paper is something that you cannot easily get back. So plan ahead where possible. Don't overload every area. Because otherwise it's very hard to get it to really click. I'm going to use just a couple of little touches of the stronger lemon yellow mix against the edge of the cliff. I want that light to bleach across it. I'm just giving the brush a quick wash out. I want to just get there and define the end of our headland here. I want to do it quite gently. Really want to retain 
some more light at the end. Going to build. So now just starting to increase the pigment load here. We're going to play through these shadows a little bit more. Another big brush, nothing on it, we're just going to run through. And just clean up that baseline edge on the water here. A little bit of colour that that's just picked up can be used along the edge of my rocks here. Now we're going to let this dry for 10-15 minutes and we'll come back and start working the rock surfaces next and building the next layer. Okay, we're back. So I've let this completely dry out, and I've actually given it a couple of hours to dry this time around. And we are now going to start building some more depth into the cliffs first. Just reactivating some of the colour that's already on the palette as we'll be able to util utilize a lot of this to bring out the smaller details. This time I'm not pre-wetting the paper. Starting with the edges of the cliff here. Those people who know this area know how definitive these little points can be. So it's using a wet on dry wash here. The paper is going to be kept dry but the paint is still watered down quite considerably. Once I get this initial block in for the wash, I'll start introducing other colours into it as well. So I'm just going to pick up a little bit of the blue. I just want a dab of the violet in this mix as well. Being very careful with these as they are quite potent. So I don't want to introduce them too heavily. That was why I pre-layered some colour in here first. Using cool shadows in against the warmer lights that I've already got working. It's a nice juxtaposition with the temperature through this area, which just accentuates what I played on in the initial wash. I'm 
Get a little bit more of the crimson going. I don't need it super strong. Just want to introduce some little touches, little notes as we pull forward from the distant section of the cliff here. One thing that I find quite handy is if you've pre-wet an area and you just want to soften an edge, taking a brush that's just got water on it and dabbing that edge. See how it's starting to bloom a little bit? I'm actually wanting it to do this. It allows me to lose some sharp edges through this section while retaining some crispness down in this co bottom corner. I like working with transparent glazes in this sort of circumstance. I'm using gentle washes to change and influence the scene layer by layer. Sometimes you just have to get in and go for it, but where I can I find this is a nice approach just to stay in control. can get some really nice soft effects using this approach. Fairly high key scene here, so nothing is going to be super, super dark when it comes to the background info. So I'm just ghosting in a few of the trees along the, the top of this headland here. As I come through here, you'll see how laying down that really vibrant golden green to start off with just helps get everything happening. And then we can continue to manipulate the color and get a lot of variation just through little accents of this dirty mix. Still working reasonably large with the brushes. This is a number 10, just a little tackle on round that I work with. I've worked with sable brushes and stuff in the past and yes they are beautiful to to get going but I find these little tacklons are a nice synthetic to to get you started. If you're just trying to get a feel for what you can do, they're a good way to get you you going. We've got a nice spring to the brush. And being a, a number 10, being a reasonably large brush, they're equally adept at the finer details and the larger, broader strokes too. Just introducing a tiny bit of the burnt sienna here, just a little bit of warmth across the top part of the cliff and through through these trees. Now I'm dry brushing this in, so I've just got the tiniest amount on the brush, but I'm not trying to wet it, I'm just going to let it hit the paper and do what it does. The 
this background section is still slightly damp, so I can just pull that edge a tiny bit. And the cliff starts to really allow the light that we had in the background to push through a bit more. Next up, we're just going to take going to bring in an interesting mix here. We're actually working with rock faces. I'm going to start with some Viridian, Violet, these two are phenomenal for making darks. Especially for the sea, these, this is my, my go-to combo. Viridian and Violet and a little bit of Thalo Blue if needed can work so effectively for that sort of stuff. I'm just going to get a bit of the, the burnt umber going here. Mixing those through, we end up with this really nice, dirty dark. Going to just take the tiniest amount of my brilliant red into this as well. Now this is going to be used to wash in some of the shadow forms on my rocks. I'm just going to roughly scribble these in, sketching with the brush, letting the roughness of the paper work for me. So with this, I'm working on a not pressed or a cold pressed paper. Gives me a little bit of texture, a little bit of tooth. Hot press is nice for certain things, but I do find, especially for the beginner, a not press or a rough paper is a much better way to start. And you just have a, a little bit more resilience in the surface. It's not quite as slippery. Which I find especially when you're getting started. And for landscape and stuff, it gives you a bit more play. For certain subjects, a hot press paper is great. If you're doing very illustrative work, that's really when it when it comes into its own. But for the more impressionistic works, landscapes, things like that, the not press or the rough is definitely a better option. So, just coming back with some dry brush marks, like what we were just doing before. Letting them bounce across the surface. It's a lot about the suggestion. As we move out here, with these ones out and off in the distance, I want them to fairly high key. So when it comes to high key, you're not doing super dark. You're allowing the light to bleach it a little bit. Still got a lot of this puddle that I can work with. I'm going to use that to just to catch edges 
not actually wanting to utilize a lot of it through the shadow itself. For that we're going to play a few other colors. And you can see how just by running the brush quite low to the surface we can really accentuate that paper texture which is brilliant for working with rock surfaces. Now for this video I have turned the spotlight off so we're seeing a much more natural colour here going to bring a tiny bit of burnt sienna in now still keeping to the depth in the mix on our foreground parsons this is quite handy just to get the edges to lift up a little bit a few little warmer notes here and there As we move back into the cliff and the foliage, this is a great way to help lift that warmth into the scene. So stronger contrasts over in this corner, really using that as an anchoring point. At the moment. going to get a little bit of our yellow going to mix into this as well and this can come back through to reflect a little bit of the color through With this pass on the reflections, I'm starting to use more open broken marks. Bring a couple of little touches through here as well. Obviously the closer we get to where we are here, we're starting to see through the water a little bit more. And at that point you can start to play with that rippling through the surface, starting to see the little rocks and warmer under colour shining through. Now that we've got a lot of this set up, I'm just going to get there and grab a little bit of violet Browning it off ever so slightly. And just washing that through in against some of these dry brush marks.
while the paint's reasonably soft, so not dry. I can actually manipulate edges, which I find is a great little way to control some of these points. got that color going we can just refine a little bit of the shadow I like having it quite soft just bleeding out into the background a bit can introduce a touch more blue in there mixing up some soft green which can be used to build depth and accentuate some of these points Any bit of violet can just be used again through these foreground sections to play with the ripples a bit. Now we're going to let this dry for a few more minutes and we will do a bit of a tweak to the sky and build a bit more depth. Hope to catch you again soon. Okay, we're back to keep working on this. We're just going to increase the depth in the shadows here, so I'm, I'm really going to focus on this nice warm dark that I've got here in the corner which is just a combo of the violet, a bit of burnt sienna and a little bit of crimson I don't need it everywhere but I want to use it along some of these rock edges just to really lift them out a bit more. In particular along the edge here where we've got these sharper contrasts I really want the warmth of this area sort of juxtaposing the coolness of the other behind it. Paper is still slightly damp, so I'm just really loading up the pigment level here. As you can see, it's sitting over the top of what's already there. And what looked dark on those initial passes is actually quite light. 
And that's how watercolor normally works. You're going to find that those initial block-ins, as rich as they may look when you get there and put them in, always dry back a little bit lighter. It's taking that tiny bit of phthalo that's left on the palette, we're going to use that to wash down some of these shadows. In particular, a long some of these edges want these reflected points just a little bit deeper general rule is your warmer, warmer colors are going to be used in foreground, cooler colors in the background. That's especially true for areas like shadow, but that being said, there's going to be cases where cooler shadows are going to be more effective. That's why I'm using a combination of warm and cool spaces through these shadow points. To keep things a bit more interesting. Just taking that same warm mix, I can use that in against the treetops, creating some very nice little transition points here. At this point we start to see a lot more coming through in the shadows on the cliff. All still suggested, but just enough detail there to grab the eye and drag us back. Going to sit on this for a while. We'll get there and do a couple of little tweaks soon, but we're pretty much near the end of the process. Okay, so we're back to build a bit more depth in this. The colours that you're seeing on screen now will be much more representative to what I actually have on my paper this time. I realised my white balance was thrown out earlier. So, this has had a full day to dry. And at this point, I can start building some smaller details. Bring another layer of texture through some of the shadow forms. Again, just working with my number 10 round here. find it works quite well for 
broad stroke stuff like this. So what I want to try and do is accentuate the ridge of some of these shadows and allow other areas to sit back a bit more. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a razor blade with this razor blade I can actually get there and just scrape back parts of the surface I find this is really good for sparkle on water or in this case just lifting touches of texture out on rock surfaces this is why I work on a 300 GSM paper it's actually comes from my time doing scratchboard to be able to reveal little touches like this not a traditional watercolor method by any stretch of the imagination but something I've brought into my little toolbox along the way With rocks in particular, I find this is a really useful tool. And it just roughs up the surface. I'm not, not obliterating it, I'm not destroying it. If you try and do this with a wood pulp paper, you're going to be in for all sorts of grief. But on a, a half decent cotton paper it will take a little bit of beating and all I want to do is scratch into the top layer only I'm not trying to destroy the painting surface I'm not out to get there and completely wreck what I'm doing here. This takes a very gentle touch. This is a brand new razor blade, scalpel blade that I'm working with. So super super sharp. If you're going to try this method please I advise caution because in all honesty I wouldn't be using it like this normally. Keep it in the holder if you can. I'm used to using blades enough that getting there and taking it to the surface like this doesn't stress me too much. I'm going to create a little bit of sparkle just through this section. And so to do that I'm just roughing across our distant water you can see ever so slightly how it's just breaking that surface a little bit with that out of the way we can go back in the great thing about that scratch idea is I can r reveal texture in the paper bring gentle washes over it to give it a completely different look I don't want to lose all of the sparkle but certain parts can be quietened down a little bit look at how the edges just start to react here giving us a bit more visual interest
I tend to bring techniques from different mediums into whatever medium I'm working with. So not necessarily keeping to the core of one specific medium, but taking that knowledge that I've built up through pastel, through working with acrylic and oil, scratch board in this case, and being able to utilize that to get something that feels a little bit richer and more me when I go to work on these little scenes. And there's things like that little scratching technique. It's not the sort of thing that you need to do on everything. In this particular scene, it just it felt like it needed to be there, so that's why I introduced it. So these gentle washes being brought in uh, just to get there and accentuate some of these points. So focusing on those cooler blues and greens in the background. I'm going to bring a little bit more violet into my mix. Coming through some of these rocks in the foreground. This gives it a nice warmth. A little bit more of the burnt umber. Not quite activated enough yet. And generally at the start of each session I I like to in some cases just squeeze out a bit more paint. With this we're just going to keep with what we've already got in the palette. So you can see the, the subtle contrast here, the richer touches of the burnt umber near where those edges of the light source are coming in. The violet also playing into those spaces. Those little touches in here make a huge difference to creating more depth. Just going to bring a touch of warmth through these trees in the background. Getting that sense of the sun really pumping through them. A few little marks off in the distance here, just re representing some birds out in the sky. And this one is ready to be signed. Hope you got something out of the demo. And look forward to seeing you for my introduction to watercolor classes coming soon.